And we'll start with a prayer to our Blessed Mother. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Most sacred heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. Immaculate heart of Mary, good Saint Joseph, in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So as I begin this particular presentation, what I hope to do is not to cause any discomfort. This is one of those topics where emotion will necessarily enter into the discussion. And what I'm trying to do is not to sound cold or callous or sort of not relating to others and some of the difficulties that they may have had in the past with the loss of a child, especially an unbaptized child, but also to teach the importance of seeing heaven as a supernatural end, which is beyond us. It is something not owed to us naturally. It is something which is completely infinitely beyond the reach of the natural normal man. So we're trying to protect the notion of supernatural life, divine grace, and the beatific vision of heaven, which is a gift which not all have received. So we begin with the title, Limbus Infantium, which means the limbo of the infants and the title next to it is Don't Close the Doors on Limbo Yet. And the reason that title was chosen is because there are many articles that came out a few years back which because of a ruling by a body known as the International Theological Commission which has no authority whatsoever, the, the newspapers said the doors of limbo have been closed. No one's there. Everybody's been let out. So this is a summarizing of that doctrine, that teaching of limbo. And we know that we should look at this carefully because let's face it, folks, there's been catechetical nightmares over the last number of decades. For example, an Advent newsletter was sent to me last year from a religious education office in a diocese in Missouri. The newsletter correctly stated that Advent is a season when we especially celebrate Our Lady and her role in salvation. But knowing the state of modern catechesis, it is inevitable that confusion would enter into it. And so the particular thing that was sent to me, the newsletter, had this quotation, quote, after the announcement that she was to be the mother of the Savior, the newsletter continued, the miracle of the Immaculate Conception happened, unquote. Remember that is a reference, the Immaculate Conception, to our Lady's Conception, not our Lord's conception. So again, catechetical nightmares being seen. Such a mistake is common today, especially amongst many Roman Catholics. It is unfortunate, unfortunate for sure. Mary, we know, was preserved from any stain of original sin, while we are cleansed from that stain of original sin by water and the Holy Ghost. Now, it is a teaching, speaking of baptism, that's how we're cleansed of the stain of original sin. It is a teaching that baptism, sacramental baptism, is absolutely necessary for salvation, at least in so far as its effect, namely sanctifying grace and rebirth or regeneration. If one doesn't have sanctifying grace, one cannot be saved. That is our faith. If a person has no grace in the soul, at death he will spend eternity separated from the good Lord insofar as a supernatural beatitude, a supernatural vision of God in heaven. One can never see God face to face unless one is made like unto God by grace. Therefore, how we do need baptism, and this is especially true for the infant, this is a quotation from Pope Pius XII of Holy Memory. It was given on December 20th, 1951. And Pope 
Pius XII was addressing a group of Italian midwives, important person to speak to, midwives, who at times would have to baptize a dying infant in the case of an emergency. And so Pope Pius XII stated the following. This is the talk he gave to Italian midwives. Quote, all that we have said about the protection and care of natural life is with even greater reason true for the supernatural life, which the newborn child receives at baptism. But then the Pope continues, and he added, in the present dispensation, in the way that things are set up, there is, quote, no other means of communicating life to the child who has not the use of reason. For an adult, Pius XII continued, an act of love may suffice to obtain sanctifying grace and so supply for the act of baptism to the child still unborn or newly born, this way is not open, unquote. Now it seems that Pius XII was just carrying on a common belief from those who came before him, including his holy predecessor, Pope St. Pius X, whose famous catechism, the St. Pius X Catechism, clearly stated the following. Children who die without baptism go into limbo where they do not enjoy God, but they do not suffer either, unquote. Now, this is a catechism that was used throughout all the diocese of Rome and in many, many places. And we'll look later at our Baltimore Catechism, which anybody over a certain age uh, remembers the Baltimore Catechism, and people still use it today, especially in homeschooling families. And it certainly clearly teaches, very plainly, the notion of limbo. Again, because of the absolute need for grace, along with the fact that infants seemingly can only obtain this gift at holy baptism, theologians posited, they put forth an idea, the idea of limbo as a place for unbaptized children who die before reaching the age of reason. Now, the Catholic Encyclopedia, published by our Sunday visitor, speaks of the belief in limbo as something, and they love to say this, as something of the Middle Ages that was never an official position advocated by the church. Many theologians today see the limbus infantium, the limbo of the infants, as an old, antiquated theological opinion. Modern churchmen label the limbo of the infants as a mere speculation, a theory, an hypothesis of the scholastic period of St. Thomas Aquinas. It was, they say, a particular curiosity, they call it, a curiosity of the age of faith with no real foundation in divine revelation. Again, they're so dismissive of what every child learned in the United States back in the 1950s and before. I mean, every child learned about limbo in the 1950s and before that. For them, limbo should be abandoned. The former head of the Christophers, for example, whose column appeared regularly in diocesan newspapers, stated back in 1997, it always bothered me that innocent babies, that's an important word there that we will go back to, innocent babies were in some way ineligible to receive the fullness of God's love. Now I know better. Catholics today do not have to believe in limbo. There is one place of eternal rest, and that is heaven. This is also seen in some of the more modern sort of Positions taken in the last 10 or 20 years, especially. Father, Father Ketamalesa, he's a papal preacher, still is today. He, he does the Lenten exercises. He preaches before the Holy Father and before some of the cardinals of the Curia. And then obviously, if you remember this from a few years back, 2006, limbo does not exist, says the Pope. Well, you should be careful with how that was put forward by the media, 
But still, this seems to be the orientation that is now presently taken. So Father Catamalesa, the papal preacher, says the following. Let us forget the idea of limbo as a place. Just forget it. In which children who are not baptized will end up. The fate of children who are not baptized is no different from that of the Holy Innocents. You all know the Holy Innocents. December 28th, we celebrate their feast day. Those are the 72 baby boys that were put to death by King Herod's men. And they died in place of Christ. They died as a witness to Christ, the Savior, uh, and allowed him to find refuge with his foster father and Our Lady as they escaped eventually to Egypt. News reports then came out just before the release of that document from the International Theological Commission, which again has no authority whatsoever, saying the following, quote, The Pope will cast aside centuries of Catholic belief later this week. <laughs> Just look how that's sort of phrased. The Pope will cast aside centuries of Catholic belief later this week by abolishing formally the concept of limbo, which he didn't do, by the way. It has not been abolished. In a gesture calculated to help win the souls of millions of babies in the developing world for Christ, who may not be Christian. So, why is this happening? Where there is such a dismissive view. The church will cast aside centuries of religious belief. Why is this happening? Part of it can be called magisterialism. That's kind of a fancy word. You might have heard the word magisterium before. Magisterium is a fancy Latin word which refers to the teaching authority of the church, especially possessed by our Holy Father and bishops in union with him. Magister in Latin means teacher. And the teaching church are only the pope and bishops. Priests are just messengers of the teaching church. Priests cannot teach officially, cannot define things. Only popes and bishops in union with the Pope can be a part of such definitions. But magisterialism means this. Basically, it's a fixation on teachings that pertain only to the current, present-day magisterium. For them, the only standard by which they judge orthodoxy is whether or not one follows the current present magisterium without any concern for past teachings and the contribution of sacred tradition. So it's all about being up to date. Oh, they used to believe that way back when, but hey, we're modern people now. Everything has to be very current. Traditional Catholics tend to take not just the current magisterium as their norm, but also scripture, tradition, and the current magisterium as the principles of judgment of correct Catholic thinking. So to be a true Catholic, you got to take it all from way back when and now. And you have to make certain judgments in terms of accepting things as well, using both the past as well as the present. Uh, we we want to be very careful that there's a great quotation from G.K. Chesterton, a famous journalist in England, and he said, tradition is the democracy of the dead. See, Catholics allow the dead to vote. Not just Chicago, but Catholics allow the dead to vote. In a sense, the voices of the dead are heard in the Catholic Church. What our ancestors believed is what we ought to believe. Now, inevitably, this magisterialism always being up to date, only the current things matter to us, leads to something similar to legal positivism. Inevitably, this magisterialism has led to a form of positivism. The teaching of the church is whatever the modern popes and bishops say it is, even if it seems to be in contradiction to tradition. Since there are no principles of judgment other than the current up-to-date magisterium, whatever the current magisterium says is always what is orthodox. As a result, whatever comes out of the Vatican, regardless of its authoritative weight or non-authoritative weight, is 
to be held, even if it contradicts what was taught with comparable authority in the past. Since non-infallible, and some many things that come forth from the magisterium today are non, non-infallible acts of the magisterium, they can be erroneous. If you have been following the last three weeks in Rome and you've seen some bishops speak about some matters regarding marriage, if you think that everything they say is infallible, I think you should recheck your faith. While we are required to give religious assent even to non-infallible teachings of the church, what are we to do when a magisterial document contradicts other current or previous teachings and one does not have any more authoritative weight than the other? It is too simplistic merely to say that we are to follow the current teaching. What would happen if in a period of crisis of the faith like our own, a non-infallible, ordinary, magisterial teaching contradicted, contradicted, mind you, what was in fact the truth? If one part of the magisterium contradicts another, both being at the same level, which is to be believed? What's up to date? Unfortunately, what has happened in many quote-unquote, conservative sort of areas have acted as if non-infallible ordinary magisterial teachings are in fact infallible when the current magisterium promulgates them. This is a positivist mentality. If he says it, it must be the faith now. In the past, well, I guess we've changed. That's not how the church works. Tradition is the democracy of the dead. St. Thomas Aquinas has a vote when it comes to the Catholic faith, even though he's passed away. Now, a few years ago, a few years ago, an announcement came forth, 2006, from the International Theological Commission, which I've mentioned a couple of times, regarding the fate of unbaptized babies. Pope John Paul II had requested that the commission, that the commission come up with a more coherent and enlightened way, he called it, of describing the fate of such children back in October of 2004. The Catholic News Service reported that Archbishop William Leveda, who was president of the International Theological Commission and the prefect also of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, hoped that a statement would be forthcoming that would basically close the doors on limbo forever and abandoned this outdated, quote-unquote, theological hypothesis, unquote. And by the way, just to show you, that's uh, that was a member of the theological, International Theological Commission. He just resigned a few days ago, a couple weeks ago. There was reasons why he did if you remember that from the news. So don't think that the ITC is in any way infallible. They're purely an advisory board that has no authority whatsoever. Now, with all due respect, with all due respect to these gifted theologians and churchmen on the commission, the ITC, I think we ought to not close the doors on the limbo of infants. In fact, considering the teaching and practice of the church since her very foundation, it would be impossible to close the doors on limbo and abandon this common belief without doing great harm to the faithful. Consider, for example, what Pope Pius VI once stated. This pope condemned, condemned, mind you, the Jansenistic teaching as, quote, false, rash, and injurious to Catholic education because they, the Jansenists, he continued, claimed that it was a Pelagian fable to hold that there is a place which the faithful generally designate by the name of limbo of children for those who depart this life with the sole guilt 
of original sin, unquote. Now that is in the famous sort of text known as the Denzinger, which is all the official acts of the church. So you have an official condemnation of the Jansenists who denied limbo, and the Pope condemned them for that denial. Now has the church ever taught the existence of limbo? We've got to begin with quid est limbo. What is limbo? First, we have to define what actually is meant by it. The word comes from the Latin word limbus, meaning edge or border. In short, limbo is the edge or border of hell. It is the very outer circle or the penthouse of hell, if you will. You can split limbo into sections. First, the limbus patrum. That is the limbo of the fathers, where the saints of the Old Testament, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the great holy prophets like Isaiah and Ezekiel, the limbo of the fathers, that is the place where the saints of old, before the coming of Christ, remained until Christ's coming and the work of redemption. Remember, Christ ascended into hell. This is a defined doctrine of our holy faith. It is in the creed. He descended into hell. He descended to the dead. He went down to those temporarily separated from the beatific vision of God who died in the state of grace. Key point. Key point. They died in the state of grace. In other words, again, our Lord visited Abraham, Moses, David, Sarah, Abigail, and all the other just ones that he would bring up to heaven with him. Psalm 67 states that our Lord ascended on high and he took captivity captive. He brought them to heaven. The spoils of his victory over Satan were the souls of the just ones who died with no unrepented mortal sins upon their souls but who could not pay the price of the original sin. I mean, why is it that Abraham, who was very holy, why didn't he go right to heaven when he died? He certainly was in a state of grace. He did not die with any unrepented mortal sins upon his soul, but he couldn't pay for the original sin of Adam. It was Adam's sin that closed the gates of heaven, and only a new Adam... Only Christ Jesus could open those gates. Christ Jesus did not descend into the hell of the lost souls and demons. Rather, he went down to the upper regions of the dead. And from this position, the saints tell us, he stomped on the ceiling of the hell of the damned, if you will. And this, called all, and this caused all the wicked in hell to tremble. And it let the devil know, that Christ Jesus was the victor, and he was delivering the old Adam and the old Eve, all the just ones from confinement. According to St. Thomas Aquinas, the common doctor, the greatest of all teachers in the church, the Holy Fathers of the Old Testament, in whom there was the least amount of sin, were consigned to a higher and less darksome region Apart from those who were condemned to punishment. So St. Thomas Aquinas is saying that those who died in the Old Testament, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the good ones, they were consigned to an upper region away from the fires, away from the punishment of the demons. Limbus infantium. You probably have heard of uh, Dante Alighieri, who wrote a very famous series of books on heaven, paradiso, on purgatory, purgatorio, and also on hell, the inferno. It was the common belief throughout the whole Middle Ages that there were different levels of hell. The lowest levels were the worst sins, okay? And then the less, the less sins, and then obviously no actual sins, or at least no actual unrepented sins up here. The first level of hell being limbo. Again, it was the common belief of all the people back at that time in Christendom. For this presentation, though, we need to consider another section of limbo, one that is not temporary, but rather forever. And that is, as I've mentioned, the limbus infantium or the limbus puerorum, 
the limbo of the children. The place of those infants who die in original sin but are innocent of any actual committed sins or omitted sins. St. Thomas Aquinas states that when our dear Lord descended to the dead, he only delivered the fathers in limbo, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Adam and Eve. For they had faith, he writes, and grace. But as for the infants, they had not the use of reason at their death and so could not be united to Christ's passion and death by faith and charity. Again, St. Thomas Aquinas. Now, one has to be careful to emphasize that limbo is not some sort of middle ground where the souls of unbaptized infants are suspended somewhere between heaven and hell. And why is this? Because it is the divine teaching of Holy Mother Church that in the final analysis, souls after death are either supernaturally saved or they are not. This realm of the dead is not like purgatory. The limbo of the infants, again, is the outer circle of hell. And although those present there do not experience the pains of hell in any way, they do suffer the eternal supernatural loss of the beatific vision of God. Key term, supernatural, above our nature. They'll never see the good Lord face to face in that state of supernatural beatitude. They will know God but they will not know him as face-to-face in the beatific vision. Key point. This is a huge point, which is the key to this entire presentation. Now, why did the fathers of the church, this, I, this is the teaching of the fathers of the church, why did the fathers of the church and the great theologians like St. Thomas Aquinas of the past posit, put forward, the limbo of infants? Human beings, this is the key, Human beings are the only creatures on earth made for an end, created for a goal that they cannot reach on their own. Rabbits can reach their goal because their goal is to continue the species. And so they bring forth bunnies. They've reached their goal. That's not the ultimate goal of a man. The ultimate goal of a man is to see God face to face in heaven. But that is a goal completely beyond his reach. It is beyond any natural power that we may be equipped with. To get to the goal of heaven, we need to be lifted by grace. Only with God intervening can we come to heaven. In short, heaven is not a natural end. It is not something that is due to our nature. We do not have a natural right to heaven, which so many think today. For the heavenly mansion is not a natural inheritance. We absolutely need baptism, at least in so far as its effect, namely sanctifying grace, in order to be saved. We have to be orientated in a supernatural direction in order to get to heaven. Now, besides magisterialism, which I mentioned earlier as being one of the sources of this problem, there's also another problem. It's the error of naturalism, which is the greatest heresy that ex has existed for the past few centuries. Naturalism. Now, Father Fahey, and by the way, this, these are some of the famous naturalists, Darwin, the evolutionary theory, you know, there's a completely natural explanation, natural mechanisms that somehow brought forth the species. Karl Marx is a total naturalist that somehow human beings' problems can be solved through economic sort of mechanisms like communism. Freud, obviously the problem of the uh, uh, suppressed desires. I mean, they all sought to cure human beings using natural means. Okay, We cannot be fully cured ultimately without God's supernatural grace. Now, Father Fahey, you may have heard of him. He's a great teacher of our faith an Irish priest who wrote a lot about Christ the King. And if you like the old mass, you know that this coming weekend is the feast of Christ the King. What a great feast that is. And Father Fahey is the greatest defender of the teaching of Christ the King that the church has ever seen. 
Father Fay defines naturalism, the heresy, in the following way. He says, naturalism consists in the denial, the negation, the denial of the possibility of the elevation of our nature to the supernatural life and order. That's the first foundational belief of naturalism, that we're just natural creatures, kind of like the apes. We're not really much more than that, maybe a high-degree beast. And the notion of we're a higher creature made for supernatural realities beyond our nature is completely denied by the, the naturalists. But even more radically, Father Fahey states, it is also the denial of the very existence of the supernatural life and the supernatural order. That's why you hear for the last few centuries people saying, well, we dismiss divine revelation. We act according to reason alone. We don't need divine revelation. We don't need faith to perfect us. That's all naturalism. That's all naturalism. Naturalism may be defined, therefore, as the attitude of mind which denies the reality of the divine life of grace and also obviously denies the existence of original sin, the fall from grace. If you deny grace, you're going to deny the very foundational doctrine of original sin, which is huge when it comes to this particular topic, to say the least. Next, where does this naturalism affect the church? The naturalists I mentioned, Father Fahey wrote down, are basically the atheists, the agnostics, the deists that were out there for the last few hundred years. They either denied God, they thought God was just a watchmaker off in some distant quarter who didn't care about us at all, or we said God could exist, maybe he doesn't. We became very naturalist. But what about the error or the unsound theology of naturalism entering into the church. The error of naturalism can also be seen in less obvious ways, but it's there. For example, there's the problem of conflating, conflating nature and grace. That is, instead of seeing the distinction between grace and nature, that they are separated, the conflator will bring them together and make them one. So grace is no longer really supernatural, and nature is sort of supernatural. And I'll explain what a horrible thing that can lead to, to say the least. When you conflate nature and grace and make them one, you have a serious problem. That's why I call... Henri de Lubac, famous uh, individual who received much of his sort of inspiration from a priest known as Teilhard de Chardin, both Jesuits. They're both part of the sort of new way of theology, which is different from what the church has used in the past. We can call him the conflator, not the deflator, but the conflator. Because he takes grace in nature and he makes them one, or at least brings them together. Very dangerous. This can be seen in the teaching of Father Henri de Lubac, who, by the way, is very popular amongst many people. Many conservative Catholics think that he is truly the great Orthodox champion. I will be very cautious with him. He taught that the supernatural is a necessary perfection of nature. Now, these things are difficult to understand. I apologize for some of the depth of this topic, but it, it, it has to be covered. He taught that the supernatural is necessary for the perfection of nature. So it's not a gratuitous gift that we don't deserve, but hey, it's necessary. You owe it to me, God, to be given supernatural life without which nature is frustrated and its longings for the supernatural perfection. This means that the supernatural is needed to complete nature, which remains incomplete without it. All of a sudden, grace becomes owed. God, you owe me grace because of my nature. Hence, the supernatural is not freely given 
a gratuitous gift, but rather a part of nature owed to nature. In other words, the supernatural is not supernatural, but natural, and lies within the bounds of nature. Huge problem, to say the least. Now, why is this wrong? The Catholic Church teaches that the whole supernatural order of grace is exactly that, gratuitous. It's a sheer grace, a gift of God. Nature must be capable or well-suited to receive this gift of supernatural grace, but it is in no way strictly required to receive grace, which is of a different order, an order that is immeasurably, infinitely superior and given by God as God wills, and in a manner essentially independent of the received nature. Now, this new theology always leads to pantheism. So if you take the supernatural life and you bring it down a level to our nature, all of a sudden our nature becomes like sort of divine. We're like naturally supernatural. So if everything is divine, that's pantheism. That's what the definition of pantheism is, where God and creation are really ultimately the same. We're all divine. And that's why the New Age movement is all about pantheism. I'm a god. We're all gods. Therefore, we don't need a god telling us what to do. We don't need his help. This huge error applies to our present topic today, of limbo of the infants. It may explain why limbo is rejected by so many people today. Again, the error of naturalism and conflating nature and grace leads to a denial of limbo. You see, if God implanted a natural desire, a natural desire, mind you, for the supernatural life and the beatific vision in man and to be just, God must fulfill our natural desires. What kind of God would he be if he aroused in us these longings for the beatific vision, a supernatural vision, and then he would frustrate them by not giving us what we need? But that turns the beatific vision into a matter of justice. He owes it to us rather than an act of mercy and grace. Limbo becomes, therefore, a joke in this system. Now, in one way, little children are most innocent. Little babies before the age of reason are most innocent, for they're not culpable of any wrong deeds whatsoever. They're not capable, in fact, of performing any deliberate actions that would be contrary to the law of Almighty God. But if we believe in original sin, which is a foundational dogma of our faith, that's why Christ came to save us, especially from the sin of Adam, which closed the gates of heaven. They are conceived and born, that is the infants, as members of a fallen race. When a child is conceived outside of the Blessed Mother, when a child is conceived and a child is born, they are born without grace. That is why from apostolic times, infants have always been baptized. You must baptize infants. That's why the Council of Trent made the following point in one of its documents. By reason of this rule of faith from the tradition of the apostles, apostolic custom, even infants who could not as yet commit any sin of themselves, are for this reason truly baptized for the remission of sins, so that in them there may be washed away by regeneration, rebirth, what they have contracted by natural birth or generation. We baptize our babies for a reason. They need sanctifying grace in order to become adopted children of God the Father in Jesus Christ. Now, as mentioned before, an unbaptized person who has reached the age of reason can receive rebirth 
through a baptism of desire. For they are capable of freely responding to those actual movements of God, those actual graces of God, which are supernatural motions towards the state of sanctifying grace. So you have a person who's unbaptized, let's say in some this country or some other country, what we used to call pagans, he can be moved by grace if he's reached, reached the Asia region. He can respond to that. Also, the Roman Catechism of the Catholic Church, this is the Catechism of the Council of Trent, catechism that was the foundation for all the catechisms that came for centuries afterwards, including the Baltimore Catechism. The Roman Catechism of the Council of Trent taught that an infant coming into the state of grace, quote, cannot be affected otherwise than by baptism. And then it charges, makes responsible the pastors it, that they should inculcate the absolute necessity of administering baptism to infants. That is still true today in all the books of the church, especially canon law, to insist on baptizing children as soon as possible after birth. In short, there is no divinely revealed way of infants being cleansed of original sin and coming into the state of grace except through sacramental baptism. This is what the fathers of the church taught. That's why the fathers of the church taught about a limbo of the infants, even if they did not use that exact phrase. You see, the teaching of the limbus infantium was not some sort of thing of the Middle Ages, not a curiosity of the scholastic men of, of old like St. Thomas Aquinas. It was a necessary theological conclusion for many during the age of the fathers, the patristic age, those men who were way back in the early centuries. St. Gregory Nazianzen, for example, right here. St. Gregory Nazianzen, an Eastern father of the church, stated that infants dying without baptism will neither be admitted by the just judge to the glory of heaven, they will not be admitted to the supernatural end of heaven, but nor will they be condemned to suffer punishment, since though the unbaptized are not wicked, from the fact that one does not merit punishment does not mean, it does not follow, rather, that he is worthy of being honored. So that's kind of a, a good thing to remember. From the fact that one does not merit punishment, because there's no actual sins in an infant, it does not follow that he is worthy of being honored especially with a goal which is beyond human nature. Again, two points here that St. Gregory Nazianzen makes. St. Gregory Nazianzen, the father of the church, could not see his way clear to grant the beatific vision, the supernatural vision of God, to unbaptized infants. No grace means no heaven. And babies receive this gift through sacramental baptism. Secondly, St. Gregory Nazianzen could not consign them to any punishments of sense. No fires. He could never see how they could have that in hell. For since these young ones had committed no actual sins, it was only fair that they should suffer no sensible punishments. These two points brought about a necessary conclusion. There must be a place where the inhabitants experience the pain of loss, of the supernatural vision of God, but without suffering any sensible pain, but actually having perfect natural happiness. Another father of the church, St. Augustine, he is perhaps the greatest of all the church fathers, in a Latin rite father of the Western church. The doctor of grace writes the following, anyone who would say that even infants who pass from this life without participation in the sacrament of baptism shall be made alive in Christ, quote, goes counter to the preaching of the Apostle St. Paul and condemns the whole church because it is believed without doubt that there is no other way at all in which they are made alive in Christ, unquote. Again, you have 
St. Augustine saying there's no other means but sacramental baptism for the infants to come into the state of grace. This is from the Council of Carthage, which was a local council, obviously in Africa, northern Africa, and uh, its conclusions, its final findings, its final report, if you will, was approved by Pope St. Zosimus. This is in 417 A.D. And it was against Pelagius. Pelagius, member basically was a naturalist as well. He basically denied the supernatural life and the need for grace. He said all we needed was to follow Christ's example. We didn't need grace. We needed just his example and we would be fine. Very serious error of, of Pelagius. He writes the following. This is the Council of Carthage approved by Pope Zosimus. It has been decided likewise that if anyone says for that this reason the Lord said... In my father's house, there are many mansions that it might be understood that in the kingdom of heaven, there will be some middle place or some place anywhere where the blessed infants live who departed from this life without baptism, without which they cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven, which is life eternal. Let him be anathema. So people were trying to take that verse, Pelagians were, who followed the heretic Pelagius, when our Lord said, in my Father's house, there are many mansions. So they try to say, well, maybe one of the mansions, mansions is for like, you know, pagans like Aristotle and for maybe men like Homer or something like that. And maybe another mansion is for unbaptized infants. And all of that is put to rest. That is not acceptable according to the Catholic faith. Furthermore, in the 13th century, Pope Innocent III the great reformer during this time of St. Francis of Assisi and St. Dominic taught the following. The adversaries maintain that it is useless to confer baptism on infants. So he's attacking those, he's condemning those who say that infants do not have to be baptized. But through the sacrament of baptism made red with the blood of Christ, sin is remitted and entrance is gained to the kingdom of heaven. For Christ's blood has mercifully opened the door of heaven to his faithful. For it would be fitting, Pope Innocent continues, it would be fitting that all little children, so many of whom die each day, perish without having some remedy for salvation provided for them by the merciful God who wills that no one perish. There's got to be some remedy for these infants. How will they get to heaven? The remedy is the blood of Christ applied to them at holy baptism. He then continues, The punishment of original sin, original sin only, is the loss of seeing God face to face, the vision of God. The punishment of actual mortal sin is the torment of everlasting hell. And finally, we look at two canons of two ecumenical councils both the Council of Lyon and the Council of Florence. And again, these were dogmatic councils. And we also have the dogmatic council and teaching given to us by Pope John XXII. All three examples, the two councils and the papal teaching, all three examples use the same language, namely, quote, the souls of those who depart in actual mortal sin or in original sin only, only descend immediately to the dead, but undergo punishments different in kind, unquote. Now, from these dogmatic statements, it is obvious that both council fathers and popes considered it a real possibility that individuals could die in the state of original sin only, and these individuals could only be ultimately unbaptized infants. The divine teaching also brings us back to those two points made by St. Gregory of Nazianzus. Those who die only in the state of original sin are denied the supernatural vision of God, but they undergo punishment that is different in kind from the wicked. Pope John XXII said, 
they have great happiness. Those who die in mortal sin or with original sin descend immediately into hell. However, to be punished with different penalties in different ways. Again, as mentioned above, the unbaptized with original sin only may lack the vision of God, but they don't suffer any sensible pains. St. Thomas Aquinas, in fact, speaks of limbo of the infants as a place of natural happiness and natural beatitude. Considering what the common doctor, St. Thomas Aquinas, teaches about limbo, the condition of the souls in limbo, where there is true, complete, natural happiness, there would be many on earth today that would find that quite attractive. You see, punishment should be proportionate to the fault. You should punish according to the act that was done. In the confessional, when a priest goes into the confessional to hear confessions, the penances he gives to the penitents should, it be, should be at least somewhat proportional to the offense. A person confesses murder, three Hail Marys is not the proper penance to give. This is why the priest asks the penitent at times to give the number of times a mortal sin was committed. Asking the quantity is not just about seeing if the problem is habitual, but it's also to assist the priest in assigning a penance that is proportional. The higher or the greater the mortal sin and the greater number of them, there is going to be a larger penance, proportionally speaking. Now, original sin is not a personal sin. A personal sin of Adam and Eve, but it wasn't a personal sin of us. Rather, it's a condition that simply deprives us of a gift we call grace. A gift, by the way, again, we can't repeat enough, that is in no way owed to us. As Thomists put it, that's followers of St. Thomas Aquinas, as Thomists put it, if a man were punished in a sensible way, having only original sin, he would be punished out of proportion to his guilt. There is, again, a real happiness in limbo, the limbo of the infants. A real happiness, a real, completely pain-free environment. In fact, Archbishop Michael Sheehan wrote the following back a few decades ago. Quote, In that state, the souls in limbo are as fully happy on the natural level as human nature can possibly be. A state akin to the happiness of Adam and Eve in paradise, minus grace, of course. Archbishop Michael Sheehan then continues, The souls in limbo are not in an infantile state. They're not babies there. They are fully mature and immortal, and their bodies will be there at the general resurrection. Now, the Summa Theologiae of St. Thomas Aquinas was placed on the main altar along with the Holy Bible during the entire Council of Trent. In times past, we used to use the phrase, Ite Thomas, go to Thomas, to St. Thomas Aquinas, if you want to find the proper explanation of the faith. He is truly a common doctor, the universal doctor, officially recommended by popes and councils. But despite the support of limbo by St. Thomas Aquinas and the teachings of some of the fathers of the church, as well as a number of magisterial texts that I showed you, many today reject limbo outright. New catechetical works never even mention its possibility. Now, admittedly, there are some problems with limbo of the infants. Admittedly, there are some problems with this teaching on limbo. For example, problem number one, it is a teaching of the church that every human person born is given a guardian angel to guide him, not only in this life, but towards eternal life above. In other words, all men are created to see the good Lord face to face. We are made for an end of seeing the supernatural vision of God. But remember, key point again, we're made for an end that we cannot naturally get to on our own. 
Continuing on. The idea of a purely natural end, which limbo seems to be, the natural happiness of limbo, can present a problem. I mean, we're meant for a supernatural end. How can it just be a natural end of limbo for the unbaptized? Furthermore, Adam and Eve, the parents of the human race, were created in the state of grace. God wants us to be supernatural creatures. That's his plan for us. A supernatural existence or the life of grace, then, is something that God has included within the human family from the very beginning with the creation of Adam and Eve in the state of sanctifying grace. But still, remember, this has been the common position for, well, since the beginning. Baltimore Catechism, which perhaps some of you still use today in some of the homeschooling or in some of your catechetical training for your children or grandchildren, Baltimore Catechism writes, Infants who have not committed actual sin and who, through no fault of theirs, die without baptism, cannot enter into heaven. But it is the common belief they will go to some place similar to limbo, where they will be free from suffering, though deprived of the happiness of the supernatural life and vision of God above. Again, man is the only creature that was made for a goal that he cannot get to on his own. Every the creature on earth can achieve their goal. Mr. Rabbit brings forth bunnies. He's reached his goal. That's not true with man. Man is made for a supernatural end. But that's just the point. It's above his nature. He needs grace in order to get there. So what the theologians sometimes say is that man is kapox dei. Fancy Latin term which kind of says that man is capable of God. He is capable of entering into supernatural life. It's not potential in him. There's nothing in him that can give him supernatural life. He needs it from God. But he's the right kind of creature to receive it. Because we do have a mind. And we do have a will. Therefore, we can come to know God, naturally speaking, by reason alone. We can know there's one God. We can know that he rewards the good, he punishes the evil. There's many things we can know about God using our brain alone. It's very limited, however. We need to have God speak to us, especially through his son, Jesus Christ, and his revelation. That is supernatural. But we are the right people to receive the supernatural faith and supernatural life because we're like an arrow. We're shaped properly to soar to the heights. We are. We have an intellect and a will. We're free creatures. And therefore, an arrow is the perfect missile that can be sent upwards towards the skies. But if you don't have an archer, that arrow is not going anywhere. And we need a divine archer in order to see God face to face. The unbaptized infant They are made to see God face to face. That is the purpose for which they were born. That is true. But they only have the capacity for the beatific vision, which is supernatural. It has to be actualized. It has to be put in place by grace. All men, it is true, are destined for a heavenly reward. But not everyone has this destiny fulfilled. Now, that sounds harsh. But it's reality. That's why St. Vincent Ferrer, who's a very famous Dominican preacher, great preacher back in the 15th century, he talked about the infants of limbo in a number of his talks. And what about the infants of limbo? Again, they they don't remain infantile. But what if they do see the saints above? Are they envious? Are they angry? Are they upset? No. He writes, St. Vincent, when they see the glory of the blessed, they do not grieve, they're not saddened, because it is not relevant to them. But just as you are not saddened because you do not have a kingdom which does not pertain to you, 
But the son of a king, a prince to whom the kingdom pertains, grieves about this. He continues, neither are you saddened when you see an eagle flying because you do not have wings. So neither do these children grieve. To these the soul of Christ descends for glorious consolation. Again, the souls in limbo, the individuals in limbo of the infants are not envious, nor do they grieve when they might see the blessing. Now, some modern theologians have posited, because people want to somehow solve this dilemma. You have to be this in the state of grace to go to heaven. No option for that. You must be in the state of grace. Infants coming into the state of grace can only be affected by baptism because they don't have rationality. They can't sort of respond to God's movements. And so some modern theologians are trying to solve this issue. They have posited that the good Lord does give a dying, unbaptized infant the possibility of entering into the state of sanctifying grace before they actually pass from this world. And that's important. There is no salvation worked out after death. Salvation is always worked out while you live in the body. We work out our salvation while we're on earth. That's when it happens. Once we have passed, that's it. You can't grow in grace. You can't grow in charity. If one is in hell, they're never going to get to heaven. If one is in heaven, they're never going to fall down to hell. Your end is determined at death. There's also other theologians who have said that the prayers and the desire of Christian parents for their, for their child dying without baptism, that that might be a way to bring the infant into the state of grace. So the parents had the faith. They were going to baptize the child. And perhaps that desire of the parents passed over to the child to put the child into the state of grace. This opinion, by the way, was also held by Cardinal Cajetan, the very famous commentator on St. Thomas Aquinas. Although his opinion of the parent's desire supplying for the need of the unbaptized child, his opinion was removed from his works by Pope St. Pius V, because St. Thomas Aquinas, remember from an earlier slide, explicitly denies this possibility. He says explicitly that the parents' faith and their desire cannot supply for the child. Some others, some others have mentioned that even the desire of Holy Mother Church suffices for bringing the dying infant into the state of grace. I mean, the church is a parent, she's a mother, and she's a potential mother for all men on earth. So maybe her desire can supply for the infant. But all of a sudden, what seems to be a very extraordinary sort of allowance of God, that you have an unbaptized infant somehow extraordinarily coming into the state of grace without baptism, all of a sudden that becomes very ordinary because there are literally millions and millions of unbaptized infants out there. So somehow if we believe that all of them are given grace before their death, without baptism, all of a sudden, that's very ordinary. It's like it's just the normal channel now that God uses. Very dangerous. Next, St. Thomas Aquinas. I had mentioned the notion of maybe the parent's faith supplies for the unbaptized infant. He says, nor were they cleansed from original sin either by their parent's faith or by the sacrament of faith. He's talking about the unbaptized infants that were in limbo when, our, when, our, when Christ descended to the dead to release the captives there. That when he released the captives in limbo, Abraham, Isaac, Sarah, Rachel, he did not take the unbaptized infants with him. He did not because they did not have faith. They didn't have no faith of their own. And neither were they cleansed from original sin by their parents' faith. That is the 
teaching at least of St. Thomas Aquinas. Now with the horror of abortion, with the horror of abortion, there has been also some question of limbo as well, because so many babies are put to death throughout the world. At least conservatively, surgical abortions alone, 65 million throughout the world each year. 65 million, conservative amount. When you consider all other possibilities of abortifacients, it could be hundreds and hundreds of millions of people, babies that are put to death through these illicit means. But before we cover that horror of abortion, I wanted to give one more sort of possibility that some theologians put forward as something that God might do. Namely, that some theologians have posited that God grants the un unbaptized infant the use of reason at the very moment just before his death so that the infant can decide for or against him. So that somehow the little baby who has no real rational functionality in the fullest sense, that he is given a special enlightenment. But remember, if you go for that theory, and it's just an opinion, if you go for that opinion or theory, what if the baby says no? He doesn't go to limbo. He goes to the devil. So we have to be cautious there. And if Adam and Eve said no to God then a child that's been conceived in original sin, that does not have those gifts that Adam and Eve had, for them to say yes, that would be quite a grace would have to be given to say the least. Now, this is probably the biggest slide right here. Because this is going to be what will cause the questions to come up later. If people stay, the questions will come up. There's been a debate on the issue of aborted children who have obviously died without baptism. Some have compared them to the holy innocents slaughtered at Bethlehem who died for Christ. This was definitely a special intervention by the good Lord when the innocents of Bethlehem were murdered and martyred. For he credited the innocents with special justice, for they suffered that Christ might live. But aborted children seem to be more of a victim of a crime than martyrs dying for Jesus Christ. We would not suggest, for example, that every murder victim was somehow witnessing to the truth of the sanctity of human life. There are many murder victims that happen around this country. We're not saying that all of them are martyrs. But aborted children seem to have to be more an innocent victim again than actual martyrdom that they are experiencing. In support of this theory of a baptism of blood, if you will, for the aborted. People point to a written statement made by Pope John Paul II in his encyclical known as Evangelium Vitae, the Gospel of Life. The late Pope supposedly assured grieving mothers who had experienced abortion, quote, that nothing is definitively lost and you will be able to ask forgiveness from your child who is now living in the Lord. So he's trying to comfort the, the, uh, the mother who had made that horrible decision that she can now pray to her child and ask forgiveness from her infant who is now living in the Lord. But that key sentence that everybody points to, which is still present in pretty much every English translation, is not the official text of the Roman Catholic Church. That key sentence cited was removed. It should read rather after its proper editing and its final text the following. You can entrust your infant to the same father and to his mercy. And there's a Latin phrase, a Latin sentence out in Latin. Now your infant, your infant, the power of the same father and his mercy, you can commit to his hope. The notion of the child is now with the Lord in the beatific vision, that was removed from that text. So we cannot cite Evangelium Vitae in any way 
to say that limbo has somehow been abandoned because of this corrected text, which is the final official text of the Holy See. Sometimes when texts are printed by but the catechism, remember the catechism in 1992, it came out in 92. They sent it out, people started getting copies, and then they had corrections later. Okay, so sometimes we get these texts without the later corrections that are brought in. Another Pope of Holy Memory, this is so much different. This is Pope Sixtus V of Holy Memory. He wrote strongly against those who were involved with aborting children. He wrote in the late 16th century. This text is not an official theological text, but rather a legislative text of Pope Sixtus V. Because back in those days, the Pope was the head of the Papal States. And he was the governor of the Papal States. And so he placed severe penalties on those who would carry out abortions or sterilizations in the papal states, including capital punishment. If you were an abortion doctor, you were put to death back at this time. The Holy Father explained the reasons for such harsh penalties, and he focused in on the horrors of direct abortion, both bodily but also spiritually. I won't read to you the whole quote, but... He says, this is so horrible a crime because not just bodies are killed, but still worse, even souls, as it were, are cast away. One who has excluded such a soul from the blessed vision of God. And who, therefore, he basically says, would not condemn and punish it with the utmost severity, the desecration committed by that doctor who has excluded such a soul from the beatific vision. And again, he repeats, now this is three times now he's repeating this. So, souls are cast away, denied and excluded from the vision of God. And again, in the same text, deprive God of the services of this his own creature. So three times repeated over and over Again, now, this is not an official theological text. It's not an encyclical. But it shows the obvious belief of Catholics and the head of Catholics, the Holy Father at that time. Now, we're almost finished here. The level of teaching on limbo, what is it? Is it just an opinion? It is just some sort of theory, some sort of hypothesis none of those. It is something which we call, at least in the church, something which is theologically certain. A truth logically following from one proposition which is divinely revealed and another which is known by reason to be certain. So you have divine revelation. The highest authority of teaching is something which is de fide. It is of the faith directly revealed by Jesus Christ, our Lord, to his apostles. Then you have another level below that, which is theological certitude, where you take one proposition, one sentence, which is divine revelation. Without divine grace, you cannot be saved. That is, a, that is absolute divine revelation. Then we have a conclusion that we reach by using our reason. The only way that an infant can come into the state of grace is through baptism. We know of no other means because of the condition of the child in terms of its limitation. So, again, limbo is not an hypothesis. It's not a theory. People have called it that for years. It is not. It is the common teaching that everybody was taught for years and years and centuries and centuries by all the nuns and all the brothers and all the priests. Now many wish to close the doors on limbo forever. And they point out, well, the new catechism of the Catholic Church does not include a section on limbo. But the absence of limbo should not be interpreted as somehow a dismissal of the teaching. Finally, the Catechism gives some horrible sort of examples 
of delaying infant baptism. Perhaps the word horrible was, was wrong, but I guess the potential consequences. The present catechism does state, though, the great mercy of God allows us to hope that there is a way of salvation for children who have died without baptism, unquote. That's what the new catechism allows us to think. On the other hand, it should be noted that the same writers of the new catechism, knowing the divine revelation, cannot give us full assurance that there is a way open for the salvation of the unbaptized child, adds, all the more urgent is the church's call not to prevent little children coming to Christ through the gift of holy baptism. In other words, the church has always said, you got to baptize your children within a fortnight, within a few weeks after their birth. That is canon law. Parents are bound to follow that. Why is the church so urgently appealing to people regarding this matter? This should tell us about the practice of our faith. Baptize babies do not wait. And the more and more that we hear about this denial of limbo, isn't it funny it also coincides with parents delaying three months, six months, a year, a year and a half, two years, and the child is practically walking before they actually bring him to the baptismal font. There are serious consequences when we just dismiss limbo because we're dismissing the need for that child to have sanctifying grace. The Catechism says, the church and the parents would deny a child if they did not baptize them the priceless grace of becoming a child of God were they not to confer baptism shortly after birth. And here's the problem. Just a few years ago, I was approached by a homeschooling dad and he complained about his difficulty in having his child baptized by the local priest at his parish because the child was born at the very beginning of Lent. And so the priest said to him, well, I, I don't do baptisms during Lent. It's some sort of thing that, well, you know, when the ancient church, you know, everybody gathered at the Easter vigil and they had special baptism, converts came into the faith. Yeah. They were adults. But he had taken it to another level. And so this priest ended up denying baptism to this father's newly born child and was going to ask him to wait at least six weeks before baptism. We took up that cause and that policy was changed. Now, you might have seen, I think it's passe by now, but they put sand in holy water founts during the whole season of Lent. Have you seen that ever? I'm not sure if you ever saw that. But they put sand. So people for, for the whole year put their fingers in the holy water fount to remember their baptism. But during Lent, they got to get rid of the water, they tell us, and they replace it with sand. That is not the proper customs or tradition of the church. And finally, we look at canon law. So the catechism now canon law. Note how urgency is stressed here by the canon law of the church. Canon 867, which deals, canon law is the law book of the church regarding the society that we belong to, which is the Catholic church. Uh, but it also deals with things like sacraments in terms of their laseity, their validity, and the importance of the sacraments. So Canon 867 states that parents are obliged to seek that their infants are baptized within the first few weeks. And if the infant is in danger of death, it is to be baptized without any delay whatsoever. When we were younger, especially maybe some of the older people, you were taught by the nuns how to baptize a dying infant. Anybody who went into a hospital to work as a nurse even if they were pagans, Muslims, whatever it was, they were given a little card in a Catholic hospital, at least, on how to perform a Catholic baptism if a child was dying. What is more even so, the infant of a non-Catholic, this is how urgent it is, the infant of a non-Catholic who is in danger of death is to be baptized immediately. 
The infant of a Catholic parent, in fact, of non-Catholic parents also, who is in danger of death, is legally baptized even against the will of his parents. So even if you have like a couple of Muslim parents over there and their child is dying, you can baptize that child before it dies, even if it's against the parent's will, because God the Father is the ultimate parent of all. The Code also mentions that aborted babies, and sometimes this happens, they might be born alive, still alive, that they are to be baptized insofar as this is possible. Don't worry about a lawsuit, in other words. These things are important. We should also keep in mind to end this talk the famous story of Moses and Sephora, his wife. They had a couple of boys, I believe, and Moses, against the law of Abraham, did not circumcise one of those boys. And God was so angered at that, this is what happened. Because he didn't circumcise his child, his boy child, and by the way, St. Paul says, baptism is circumcision in Christ. That's interesting. You were circumcised as a boy eight days after birth. It was mandatory according to the law. Eight days after birth. Circumcision in Christ, St. Paul tells us, is baptism. And because Moses did not baptize right away, excuse me, didn't circumcise right away, while he was on his journey, he went to the inn, the Lord met Moses and would have killed him because of his failure to follow the law. Immediately, Moses' wife, Sephora, took a very sharp stone and she circumcised her baby boy and took the foreskin of her son and touched Moses' feet. And he said, A bloody spouse art thou to me. And when they say he touched Moses' feet, that means that Moses was already down on the ground, certainly passed out, if not already in the midst of his last breath. The commentary from the old scripture commentaries, the Lord met him and would have killed him. This was an angel representing the Lord who treated Moses in this manner for having neglected the circumcision of his younger son which his wife ended up doing for him and therefore saved his life. In conclusion, as mentioned above, the International Theological Commission, which has no authority whatsoever, presented a document on the fate of unbaptized infants in 2006. In their debates and deliberations, I would hope that the teaching on limbo would not be presented anymore as some sort of theological leftover of the Middle Ages, or as a mere speculation of pious men of old. Rather, it should be noted that the teaching on limbo has been the common doctrine of most theologians since the very time of the Church Fathers. In addition, more than a few examples from the Magisterium, the teaching authority of the Church suggest that the limbus infantium could never be abandoned as a legitimate position of Catholic theology. In fact, limbo is more than a hypothesis. It seems to be a necessary theological conclusion based on the constant teaching of the Church, namely, that those who die in a state of original sin cannot obtain the supernatural vision of God, and that babies are only cleansed from Adam's sin by sacramental baptism. So don't close the doors on limbo just yet. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.